Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, TUDA Districts and the Common Core Strategies and Resources. We are, I uh, wanted to just give you a brief explanation about TUDA. It's the Trial Urban District Assessment, and you insiders don't need any information on that. But my name is Cornelia Orr. I'm the Executive Director of the National Assessment Governing Board and moderator for today's event. The Governing Board is an independent, bipartisan board that sets policy for the National Assessment of Educational Progress, also called NAEP or the Nation's Report Card. The Governing Board is very pleased to host today's event. We are all familiar with the topic of Common Core State Standards, but tangible changes these standards require in curriculum, testing, and teaching demand intense analysis for strategic implementation. Fortunately, some of the nation's largest urban school districts have already paved the way using NAEP as a resource. Today we will explore insights from some of those districts and learn more about the important efforts of the Council of Great City Schools and resources available from the National Center for Education Statistics. Before we start, I will briefly run through today's agenda. First, we will hear from Winston Brooks, Superintendent of the Albuquerque Public Schools, who will address Common Core State Standards implementation district-wide efforts to close the achievement gaps between demographic groups and the use of TUDA and NAEP data and district information in this process. Second presenter will be Dee Dee Schwartz, Director of Special Projects for the Chicago Public Schools Office of Instruction. She will discuss Chicago Public Schools goals, priorities, and plans for implementing the Common Core State Standards throughout their district. Terry Holliday will be next. He is the Commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Education and a National Assessment Governing Board member. He will talk about Kentucky's Common Core State Standards Curriculum and Testing Initiative, their new accountability system, and the role NAEP data and information in Jefferson County's efforts to improve reading and math instruction for low-performing students. Dr. Robin Hall, Director of Language Arts and Literacy for the Council of Great City Schools, will share stories and experiences from helping officials across the country to improve student achievement and prepare for using Common Core Standards. Our last presenter, Dr. Emmanuel Sakali, a statistician for the National Center for Education Statistics, will demonstrate how to maximize the utility of NAEP data through various NAEP website tools. Following Emmanuel's remarks, we will have a brief question and answer session with all panelists. Before we begin our presentation, Jennifer, our webinar producer, will address logistics for using the WebEx system. To you, Jennifer. All right, thank you, Cornelia. Our panel will address questions during the question and answer session later in the event, but attendees are welcome to submit their questions throughout the entire presentation. Simply type your question into the Q&A window on the right side of your WebEx screen and submit to all panelists. Please be sure to include your name and organization with all questions. Panelists will answer as many questions as possible in the allotted time. If you have technical questions, please please refer to your confirmation email or call 866-229-3239. Back to you, Cornelia. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. With a career in education spanning over three decades, Superintendent Winston Brooks has developed valuable insights into standards implementation. He has served in Albuquerque Public Schools in New Mexico's largest district for four years, and he spent more than 10 years as superintendent for Wichita Public Schools in Kansas. He sits on many boards, including those of the American Association of School Administrators and Education Research and Development Institute, and he is an executive committee member of the Council of the Great City Schools. Winston, thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much uh, for allowing Albuquerque Public Schools to participate. I think what I'll do, we, we do have a PowerPoint, uh, which I'm not going to hit every page, but I do want to hit just a few. Uh, if you go to the first slide, um, I think, you know, it was incredibly important to me, and I believe ultimately then to the district, 
that the Albuquerque Public Schools be a part of uh, TUDA. Uh, it's interesting, just yesterday I had the opportunity to visit with a group of business people uh, called Leadership Albuquerque, and uh, a, a participant in that group actually asked me, is there any way in the world that we can accurately compare uh, one large urban district to another or one state to another? And outside of NAEP, uh, which we all know uh, when we do just a regular NAEP is a very small sampling of students, but when you do TUDA, it is actually a much larger sampling. And so all that said, we were extremely excited about uh, being allowed to be a part of TUDA, although let me say it comes at great risk. Um, you know, a superintendent's nightmare is that you start participating and then you are one of the lowest schools uh, in the country. Uh, that's always a huge risk, and I think Mike Castle himself has, has warned us as we uh, get involved with TUDA that, uh, you know, you've got to take the good with the bad, and it could be a mixture of both. Fortunately, uh, for Albuquerque Public Schools, we actually uh, came out a bit um, to the right of center on our uh, math and actually a bit to the left of center uh, in reading. And um, just a quick little story, I know I don't have much time, but I remember when I got the results, I was asked by the media what I thought. I said I was ecstatic about it, and I was ecstatic about it because uh, our governor uh, and our current secretary uh, spends an awful lot of time, like other uh, governors and secretaries do, in talking about how bad their state is in education. Our governor likes to talk a lot about us being 49th in the nation. And so it was, uh, it did. I was ecstatic to find out we weren't 49th. We were actually kind of in the middle of the pack. And, uh, re re and then getting hammered the next day in the media about the superintendent being ecstatic about being average. Um, but all that said, it, I, I just want to make the point that it is another piece of information uh, that is very accurate information that allows in the Tuda case to be able to compare uh, one large urban district with another looking at similar demographics. Moreover, uh, we took uh, great advantage of the information you now have on the screen where it actually compares your state's uh, standard-based assessment with the NAEP standards. In other words, in this first slide here on eighth grade reading, you'll see that New Mexico, uh, our standards on our state-based assessment is pretty much right in line, right in the middle of, uh, of what the NAEP standards are. If you'll look at, uh, these are, must be a little bit out of line here. If you go to eighth grade math, can you go to eighth grade math? If you go to eighth grade math, you'll see New Mexico state-based assessment rigor is actually towards the right-hand side or the more rigorous side of the NAEP standard. So this has been very instructive to us. Uh, when I first came to New Mexico four years ago, the state commissioner at that time kept saying that, um, you know, New Mexico's state-based assessment is, is one of the most rigorous in the, in the country. Well, this uh, information that we actually have from NAEP uh, verifies that information. It's been extremely extremely instructive, and I won't go over all those slides. I know my time is short. Uh, so when we have the opportunity to look at Common Core standards, which we are extremely ecstatic about, I think it's about time that we have, first of all, a common set of, of standards, but then hopefully we'll have a common set uh, or a common assessment at some point in time where we can actually, once again, really truly compare state to state, district to district, and how our kiddos are doing. Uh, we were we were uh, ecstatic, uh, really were ecstatic this time about uh, being selected as one of the pilot districts uh, from the council to participate with the National Governors Association, with the chief state school officers, and, um, and 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 the Council of Great City Schools. And I thought that that uh, triumphant actually uh, was something that was very very healthy and. We were actually a part of leading the pack, so we were very privileged uh, to be um, to be one of those pilot districts. We were able, again, through the help of the council, to be able to apply for a Gates grant, which we received. It was a planning grant, which we received uh, for the 2011-12 school year. Um, and because of that grant, because of the the, the support that we've received uh, repeatedly from the council, uh, we've been fairly successful 
and I think in leading the nation, quite frankly, in the implementation of pilots regarding the Common Core. Um, again, I don't want to hit all of these. The pilot project that I was just speaking of, um, if we can get to that, is this page right here. I believe uh, I'm correct about this. It was Albuquerque, Atlanta, Boston, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and St. Paul. Uh, we did identify pilot schools and teachers for fourth and eighth grade uh, in English language arts and also the math cohorts. Uh, we provided teachers and principals training to unpack standards and develop lesson plans for the first weeks of school. And I've actually had the opportunity to observe these groups of cohorts and it's just remarkable at the enthusiasm and uh, quite frankly, I think the buy-in that we're getting from our teachers. So once again, I think we're we're extremely fortunate to have been a part of the pilot. Um, I won't read all of that to you, but that's uh, some detail about the pilot project. And probably more than anything, it's the lessons learned that we've learned uh, from this pilot. Uh, teachers overall like the way the standards are structured logically, uh, progressing over time and complexity. Teachers love the fact that they are going deep in content rather than wide. I don't know how many times I've heard that, that you know, we don't have to be uh, 16 miles long and you know, a half inch deep, we can be uh, much deeper. Um, there's a new emphasis on informational text, uh, which gives many the opportunity to teach across the curriculum. Uh, and teachers are reporting that a basic knowledge of how to unpack the standards is critical to understanding how to use them. Uh, there's another page, I think, of lessons learned, and I'm not going to go through all of that. You can ask me questions, I think, towards the end. Um, the, the last slide, and I'll conclude with this, is that um, Using the Tudor results, we now have information uh, that we've never had before. Um, we can actually compare how this large urban school district, which in New Mexico, uh, we, we educate 30% of all the kids in the state of New Mexico. So there really is no other district that is similar uh, to Albuquerque. And it's extremely helpful to us to be able to look at other districts that are large, uh, first of all, but secondly, other districts who have similar demographics. That is, you know, almost 70% of our kids are Hispanic Latino kids, and uh, and that makes us different in some ways because most large urban districts are are majority African American, um, and so we can actually select other districts that are more like us that have a a large Hispanic Latino population. Um, so I, I've, I've mentioned that already. Uh, with the help of the Hanover Research Group, we're studying interventions and programs used in these peer districts. Um, and we'll be uh, cont continuing to share these practices with our board, with our community, um, and with all of our stakeholders here in the Albuquerque area. I, I, I again just want to say that even though there was a risk in becoming involved in TUDA, um, it was well worth the risk. We have more information now about how this district performs uh, compared to other large urban districts. And then with the help of NAEP being able to look at how our standards and the rigor of our standards here in New Mexico compare with NAEP standards and rigor um, has been just extremely helpful. So we're pretty, camper, uh, pretty happy campers here in Albuquerque. Thank you, Winston. Our second speaker today is Dee Dee Schwartz. Dee Dee began her career in education as a primary grades teacher in the Atlanta Public Schools. But after returning to Chicago to complete her master's degree, she soon assumed leadership roles there, including helping area, chief area officers develop metrics to track progress of student outcomes and results of school strategies. In her current position, she manages the implementation of the Common Core State Standards for Chicago Public Schools. Teachers and administrators have been preparing for the shift through a multi-year plan that phases in all literacy strands and math domains by 2014. Thank you for being with us today, Dee Dee. And thank you for having me. I, I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about what Chicago has been doing. Um, I'm really very excited about uh, Common Core at CPS. Um, I, I see this as a, a great opportunity for us to move to um, what really are fewer, clearer, and higher standards and, and much needed within Chicago and across the country. 
um, as Winston mentioned, you know, this is an exciting opportunity for us to get some alignment um, within our state and within uh, this country and, and have a better understanding of where our kids are on, on the path to college and career readiness. Um, I think it's, for, it's important to start first with the vision that CPS has for uh, moving along that path, and it's that we consist of a system of schools that prepares every student to succeed in college and career. Um, and I want to highlight the fact that uh, we're really moving towards this idea of a system of great schools and not necessarily a great school system. Um, that by building up each individual school unit, starting with uh, principal capacity and teacher capacity, um, that we're going to move towards a system where we have schools in every neighborhood that provide fantastic options for our communities, for our parents. Um, the way we're trying to, to transform this system is really through a, a three-pronged approach. Um, when we started looking at implementation of the Common Core Standards, we realized that implementation of the standards required a lot of other structural changes that needed to occur. Um, one of which was our school day, which was the shortest of any major urban district in the country. So this is probably something that people have, have uh, heard about. It's been making the press lately. But we really felt strongly that um, in being able to teach to higher standards and provide kids with more rigorous tasks and activities, um, we were doing an injustice if, if we tried to make that move without changing some of these structural limitations like the, the short school day. Um, so what we're doing is moving towards a longer school day that is also a fuller school day because of uh, the work we're doing with the standards. And also the third part of the strategy is refocusing our attention on um, how we understand and evaluate uh, teaching practice. So one of the other major shifts uh, and implementation steps we're taking is, is implementing a new framework for teaching that outlines um, what the uh, instructional practices are that we expect to see in planning and in instruction. And that's aligned to the Common Core Standards. So it's really through these three together and, and the interdependence of the three of them that we can start to make the move towards um, exposing our kids to the types of texts and the types of tasks that we know will um, will drive college and career readiness. Um, and just to highlight the strategic focus on those three, uh, you know, we looked at our NAEP data. We looked at uh, the data we got from uh, being a part of TUDA, uh, and it really um, it outlined the need for some pretty systematic change. Um, and it was also in line with the data that we looked at uh, from our EXPLORE test. I, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar, but EXPLORE is the ninth grade ver version of the ACT, essentially. Um, and our kids take EXPLORE, PLAN, and ACT. So we looked at uh, all of these data sources and, and really saw the same type of persistent problem that uh, while according to our state results, we were actually looking pretty good, you know, between 65 and 75 percent, depending on the year and, and the assessment, um, were meeting the meets benchmark according to the state test in, in elementary schools. But then when you look at some of these other assessment uh, sources, the picture is, is much different. Um, so. All of that is to say that we knew that transformation had to occur at scale and that it would require some of these uh, interdependent structural changes that needed to take place. Um, so our goal for Common Core implementation is that by the 2014-15 school year, which is um, also the year that the park test is, uh, is going to be implemented, and, and Illinois is one of the park states, um, so by that school year, all students will have access to Common Core line curriculum and instruction um, that's going to be defined by uh, CPS-specific frameworks that we're in the process of developing now. And I'll talk uh, at greater length about those frameworks in a minute. Um, the process and the timeline for getting to that end goal is um, really starting off incrementally and building over time. We know that uh, this shift is not going to take place overnight, that it's going to take a lot of professional development, a lot of um, structural changes at the school level, especially when it comes to the types of planning activities that uh, teacher teams 
are involved in. Um, so we know that it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while, and we uh, have to, to have an incremental approach. Um, so this year, uh, what we've been focusing on is building the capacity of educators to, uh, to understand the standards. So we've been doing unpacking activities, understanding what performance assessment looks like, understanding how to translate that then into a unit plan and lesson plans, um, and just building capacity to understand what those key shifts are that truly make these standards different from our former Illinois standards. Um, so we focus both on the shifts and the fundamentals of understanding, and we've also focused on the structures. So what are the structures that need to be in place to build towards uh, teachers being able to collaborate and, and uh, design instruction that's aligned to the common core? Moving into next year, the 12-13 uh, school year, the expectation is going to be that teachers actually implement um, changes in comprehension and writing. So implement units of instruction that are aligned to the comprehension and writing standards. And in grades 6 through 10, uh, implement a bridge plan for our math standards. The reason why we're, uh, we're doing it in that way is because we know that in our uh, K-5 grades, uh, where teachers teach all subjects, um, getting to the point where teachers are fully versed in the shifts in instruction and planning that need to take place will take time, and, and we don't want to basically overwhelm those teachers with uh, having expectations around uh, huge changes in both literacy and math. Whereas in the departmentalized middle grades and in high school, um, we can take the, uh, the incremental approach there with uh, a focus on math for the math teachers and uh, literacy, maintaining the focus on comprehension and writing for the literacy teachers. Um, and then moving through the next couple of years, we're uh, building in additional expectations around um, other strands of literacy. Uh, and we're also uh, revising the bridge plan for math to build in additional grades and build in additional domains uh, so that by 2014, 2015, we do have a complete, um, we have complete implementation. We have full uh, units of instruction built and complete understanding of what the shifts need to look like so that our kids are exposed to Common Core line curriculum and instruction. Um, so like I said, this year has really been about just starting to develop capacity to understand what these standards look like and what the expectations are. Um, you know, in, in a lot of cases, in a lot of schools in Chicago, uh, curriculum has been essentially scripted for many years, which means that the capacity to design curriculum and not just implement curriculum is not always there. So a lot of what we've been doing has been on backwards design and, and understanding what the process needs to look like to uh, go from standards to instruction. Um, so that's been a lot of the focus this year. Um, the way we've been uh, moving towards implementation is along a couple of different uh, venues. So we've been working with our network teams, and the networks are essentially like a sub-school districts. So each network supervises between 25 and 40 schools. Um, you know, Chicago is quite large. We have over 650 schools represented. Uh, so we, the schools are broken up into these networks. And the networks have the responsibility essentially for um, both managing and supporting schools with professional development. Um, so we've been doing professional development with the network teams. We've also uh, been bringing the instructional leadership teams of each of the schools together uh, once a quarter to move from each piece of the scope and sequence to the next. So we started off in September with just a basic understanding of the standards and how to unpack them, uh, moving into through the end of the school year, how to build unit plans aligned to the standards. Um, we've also had a, a pilot initiative with a group of 60 schools that um, has focused on not just uh, the same pace that the rest of the schools have been on, but accelerating that pace and having those pilot schools um, actually create units of instruction that they implement this year. 
Uh, and the point really with the early adopter pilot schools is to have a bank of exemplars and, and have best practice internally built so that other schools can then go and, and look to them for, um, for ideas, for advice on how this actually gets done. Uh, and finally, we've been working with a group of teachers who are helping us develop uh, what I mentioned earlier, the, the frameworks for content standards in literacy and, and in math. And those frameworks essentially build off of the PARC um, model content frameworks and outline in a more detailed fashion what the expectations are for, um, for standards coverage and types of tasks that kids are exposed through, uh, to throughout the year. Um, but give schools the flexibility to determine week-to-week -week pacing. Um, and like I said, you know, this year has really been about uh, just learning the basics of the standards and getting familiar and comfortable with the shifts in the standards um, as the expectation for learning. And the expectation for what schools are doing this year is creating the structures that we know need to be put in place in order for any of these changes to happen. So figuring out what the instructional leadership team and teacher team structures are, um, what the uh, process for classroom observation and debrief and support looks like, um, and starting to move towards an analysis of instructional tasks to make sure that, that the tasks that we're doing align to former Illinois standards um, increase in the level of rigor and complexity. Uh, as we move from the learning to the doing, throughout the course of this spring and summer, it's key that those structures are in place in order for um, any of the actual unit development and, and instruction to change in a meaningful way. Um, and finally, uh, one of the things we've been messaging is to not rush out and buy anything with the big you know, yellow Common Core sticker on it. Um, we know that publishers are you know, just ramping up their capacity to truly have Common Core line and instructional materials available. Um, so what we've been focusing on this year, uh, especially in literacy, is helping schools, first of all, audit what's currently in their building. Uh, you know, we know that the, the bands and the, the text complexity expectations have changed, and everything essentially moves down a grade um, in some ways in terms of uh, text complexity. But uh, we also know that there's a lot of existing high-quality material in school buildings now. So we want schools to first take stock of what they have. And uh, moving into next year, the focus in terms of purchasing will be on um, buying uh, authentic tech sets, especially uh, informational tech sets, because we do know that that's a weakness, that a lot of, especially in K-8, a lot of the text that we're currently instructing from is, uh, is literature. And uh, we're going to start to build capacity and uh, build uh, banks of materials that, uh, that are more informational in nature. Um, so that's really the advice that, uh, that we're giving to schools. And we're starting to build, um, uh, we're working with publishers now to build sort of the, uh, the vetted lists of texts and, and ideal pricing for schools so that they can um, start to build their, their banks of informational sets. Um, so again, just to reiterate, you know, it's a gradual approach. It's uh, working along many levels at, with many audiences, teachers, principals, uh, networks, and uh, also working with, um, uh, with a lot of help from student achievement partners, uh, David Coleman's group. Uh, and a couple of other uh, writers of the standards uh, getting their advice in, in building these frameworks and building our strategy um, and collaborating as much as possible with, uh, with other districts. Thank you so much, Dee Dee. Our third speaker today is Kentucky's fifth Commissioner of Education. He was appointed in July of 2009. Prior to assuming that position, Terry Holliday served as superintendent of the more than 20,000 student district, Iredell Statesville Schools, from 2002 through 2009. In 2010, he was named to the board of directors for the Council of Chief State School Officers, and in 2011, he was appointed to serve a four-year term on the National Assessment Governing Board, that is the policy board for NAEP. 
This year, Terry was also named as a member of the National Commission on Standards and Performance Reporting, which will develop rigorous accreditation standards for education, educator preparation. We look forward to the insights you're planning to share with us, Terry. Thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you for allowing me to participate today. It's an honor to be on the NAGBE board and work with the great staff at NAGBE and NCES. Uh, Kentucky is uh, no stranger to education reform. Uh, many uh, education historians recall the Kentucky Education Reform Act in the early 90s. In 2009, Kentucky uh, General Assembly stepped forward once again and passed some major legislation that required new standards, new assessments, new accountability models that focused uh, not on basic skills proficiency, but on college and career readiness and to make Kentucky more competitive in a global market. Uh, at we were delighted to find out about the Common Core Standards. Our teachers and higher ed folks were heavily engaged in uh, the development of those Common Core Standards, and we were the first state to adopt the Common Core Standards in uh, early 2010. Uh, we began immediately to uh, work with teachers to implement the Common Core Standards. So for the 2011-12, the current school year, we're implementing Common Core Standards in all grades at all levels. We also will be the first state to have a full statewide assessment uh, that our students are taking uh, over the next few weeks. That is assessment of standards uh, in every uh, grade, three through eight, and also high school end of course assessments. Uh, we knew very early on that it was so important to engage teachers, principals, and uh, central office administrators in developing a plan for the implementation of the standards. So what we did is we established regional networks where we had three teachers of math and three teachers of language arts from every district, uh, three principals from every district, three central office staff from every district to meet monthly to do the following things, to gain an understanding of the standards, to deconstruct the standards into uh, language that uh, uh, every teacher and parent and student could understand, and to do a gap analysis of where we currently are in Kentucky. Kentucky uh, standards versus what the Common Core would require. And then every school uh, had to develop a plan and district had to develop a plan for implementation of the standards. These teacher networks are continuing to meet monthly uh, and they are developing instructional materials for use in classrooms. They're building assessment literacy and then going back and helping develop assessment literacy in their districts. And they're definitely helping us develop uh, our expectations for uh, the new teacher effect system and principal evaluation system that we're putting in place. Um, Kentucky is a local control state, so we can't mandate one curriculum, but what we've done is provide an excellent model curriculum that uh, our listeners might want to view on the Kentucky uh, Department of Education website and lots of sample pacing guides, a gap analysis tool, and uh, many more tools available on that model curriculum framework. Uh, our key strategy right now is implementing the Common Core and providing every teacher in Kentucky with support through an uh, instructional software tool called the Continuous Instructional Improvement Technology System. This system uh, has all the standards for every subject, deconstructed standards, formative assessment items, uh, it has lesson planning tool, it has professional development linked to the standards, and in the near future we'll have the teacher teacher and principal evaluation systems tied into the system. Uh, NAEP's impact has been very strong in Kentucky as, as we look at Kentucky's progress over the last 20 years. You can see Kentucky making uh, fairly significant gains in uh, reading and math. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have a very uh, much a focus on the higher order uh, skills that sometimes are uh, left out in other areas and we have heavily focused on um, performance-based assessments, constructed response assessments in Kentucky. Uh, we've been delighted uh, to look at the progress in Jefferson County uh, through the TUDA 
uh, project and uh, see some excellent movement uh, that Jefferson County, a large uh, urban, is moving uh, closer and closer to national average and in some cases beating national average. So the TUDA data has been a gold mine for uh, uh, Kentucky and for Jefferson County to allow us those comparison purposes. Uh, Jefferson County is working very hard uh, uh, as typical of a large urban, several uh, low-performing schools, and I think we've recently been highlighted uh, the progress that Jefferson has made in moving those low-performing schools up uh, double-digit gains in, in most cases, and working very closely with a Gates Foundation grant at, to implement uh, Common Core through uh, more uh, engaging uh, uh, lessons, uh, the literacy by design work and the math collaborative that we have in place is an excellent model. Uh, the NAEP frameworks are a huge asset to our teachers as they were uh, uh, deconstructing those standards and making sure we knew how to describe that in kid-friendly, parent-friendly language. Also, the item, uh, the question tools, uh, resource has been a valuable resource for our teachers in Kentucky because it's difficult to find assessment items that are close to what Common Core is going to expect. That's been the biggest struggle for teachers this year in implementing Common Core is what would assessment items look like. So the NAEP question tool has been a tremendous uh, asset for us. And also the uh, item maps have uh, been a tremendous asset for our teachers in Kentucky. So uh, the TUDA data and the uh, excellent uh, resources of the uh, NAGB, the NAEP uh, tools, uh, tremendous resource to encourage all districts to use. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. I think you've given a great introduction to Emmanuel's presentation, but first we're going to go to uh, Robin Hall. Our next speaker keeps council members informed about research on systems and strategies for improving student achievement. As the Director of Language Arts and Literacy for the Council of the Great City Schools, Dr. Robin Hall provides critical support for the development and dissemination of information and tools to implement the Common Core State Standards. She served in various capacities for the Atlanta Public Schools uh, for more than 25 years. In 2006, she was appointed to the National Assessment Governing Board as an elementary school principal, and we were happy to have her serve there until 2010. Welcome, Robin. Thank you, Cornelia, for the opportunity to participate on this panel. The Council of the Great City Schools strives to assist our member districts in building a consistent, shared understanding of the Common Core State Standards by working directly with the developers of the standards whenever possible. We are also mindful of building this shared understanding across district departments, encouraging district teams of general education, special education, and English language learning staff together with district research department staff. The lead districts, Albuquerque, Atlanta, Boston, Cleveland, Philadelphia, St. Paul, District of Columbia, and New York City have completed their year of implementation planning and initial steps. They met together in July and October to share lessons learned and to continue their planning work. Their lessons learned have been incorporated into the draft booklet on change management that the Council plans to release this summer. Lead districts have also committed some of their work for sharing on a special Council website that is currently under development. Other districts are also advancing in their implementation efforts and have indicated that they, too, are happy to share their work. At our annual fall conference, which was held in Boston this year, the Council offered to the districts a pre-conference session on using the Common Core to help struggling readers and English language learners become independent readers of complex grade-level text. Moreover, the conference featured breakout sessions on the Common Core. Additionally, we collaborated with student achievement partners to enable districts to interact directly with the writers of the Common Core. A math retreat was facilitated by CGCS academic staff on September 21st through the 22nd in New York. 
The purpose of this retreat was to work directly with Jason Zimba, one of the lead de developers of the Common Core, to develop a shared understanding of the Common Core state standards in mathematics and examine assessment items that probe for deeper conceptual understanding. District members also brought samples of their math tasks and assessment items so that they could be critiqued by the lead developer and his team. Participants plan to refine their work in order to ensure that they measure the intent of the standards. This retreat was so well received that presenters have agreed to offer a larger follow-up math retreat that will take place in May as districts plan their summer curriculum and professional development projects. Similarly, an English language arts and literacy retreat took place November 29th and the 30th in Newark, New Jersey. David Coleman, David and Meredith Lieben, and Lily Warren Fillmore led participants through key implications of the Common Core. The well-attended conference focused on close reading of complex texts and development of academic language. Lily Wong Fillmore provided insights and videos of teachers working with English language learners and students struggling with academic language to demonstrate how all students can become confident readers of complex texts and writers of logically supported written arguments. Just recently, a Council ELA Literacy Specialty Conference took place April 23rd through the 24th in Baltimore, Maryland. David and Meredith Lieben and Rochelle Etienne of Student Achievement Partners worked with district teams in order to align Basils with the Common Core by developing text-dependent questions to selections in grades 3 through 5. This professional development will help our members make the best use of currently adopted Basils by working on text-dependent questions that could extend the life of current adoptions until better aligned materials become available. The, the results will be posted on the Achieve the Core website and the CGCS website for all districts to share by mid-July. Our annual conference for curriculum academic officers, curriculum directors, and research directors will include a common core strand and provide opportunities for districts to share successes, challenges, concerns, and to network with each other. That conference will be held at the Wynn Hotel in Clark County, July 11th through the 14th. And in an effort to develop tools to implement the Common Core State Standards, the Council is also working with the Research and Communications Departments to establish a website where districts and organizations can share high-quality materials. We are continuing to explore how we can collaborate across organizations and districts to develop tools and address shared standards. Additionally, advisory committees for ELA and literacy and mathematics have been established to build two-way communication with our members about the projects we are planning and what tools districts need. These committees are organized into subcommittees, communication, instructional resources, and professional development. Committee members will provide input and feedback as we develop tools and resources in these areas. For example, Student Achievement Partners share sample math learning progressions with us. Jason Zimba, Phil Darrow, and Bill McCollum want to build progressions to provide clarity and understanding of the intent of the standards and to provide examples of how even brief items might assess the deeper conceptual understanding. We not only want to provide feedback on the development of these materials, we want to take these progressions and with the help of our members create professional development modules for, for district customization and use. We will vet the modules with the Common Core developers and make the materials available to our members in time for summer professional development. We are also working with the communications firm to use the video footage from our Common Core professional development sessions to create one introductory video in ELA and one in mathematics. These videos will have natural pause points to allow easy use in professional development sessions. The openings can be used in a general overview session. Content-specific sessions 
will also have a facilitator guide that districts may choose to use or customize. It will contain handouts for practice with key concepts and the videos. The content of these videos is, cur is in the process of being vetted and will be posted on the Council's Common Core website by early June. I would like to close my remarks with a quote from Michael Cassidy, the Executive Director of the Council of the Great City Schools. All of us know that our urban kids need richer and more rigorous instruction. And the Common Core holds promise that this need can be met. None of us got into this field determined to see that our kids received a mediocre education. We got into it to make sure that our urban kids are recipients of excellence and excellence every day. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Boy, those tools the council is working on sound like they will be a great help to uh, people who are working in the field, and it's so nice that you're going to have them posted so people can uh, get access to them. Now, Terry Holliday did provide a good introduction to the tools that Emmanuel is going to describe for you, but let me tell you a little bit of something about Emmanuel. He works at the National Center for Education Statistics in the Assessment Division. Dr. Emmanuel Sikaili uh, conducts training workshops on analysis of the National Assessment of Educational Progress NAEP data and he maintains the quality of the NAEP data sets and the software that are located on their website. He is also the science content specialist for the assessment division and holds a PhD in physics. Emmanuel, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us about the tools. Thank, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, good afternoon. Um, as you all know, I'm with the National Center for Education Statistics, and uh, I plan today to introduce you to the abundance of tools that we have available for all our various users. The best way to access the tools is to start by going to our website and then clicking on the link to the right that says uh, sample questions, analysis data, and so on. So when you click when you click on that link, it takes you to our tools, actually to our tools. The very first one on the top is the NAEP Data Explorer. It allows you to duplicate most of the results that we have in our report and do some other analysis of what you are not able to find on our website. Find the, the scale scores and percentage of students that fit different characteristics. Then we have the NAEP question tool, and it is the, this is the tool that I plan to introduce you to. This, it contains all the items that were, that students, that were, that were presented to students during various NAEP assessments and in various subjects that have been released for your use. Then we also have an item map tool, a state comparison tool, and a, State Profile Tool, I, I invite all of you to go there and just, just play around. There are a lot of good things there that you can use. So if, we, if, you, if you, the user, click on the second button, that's the NAEP Question Tool, it takes you to, to a page that looks like this one. You will see that at the bottom you have uh, the Question Tool, the Item Map, a Test Yourself, and a Score. The test yourself is particularly interesting because you will be presented to the types of questions that our students, that the students were presented. You will answer the question and you will see if you did as well as they did or better than them. So if you click on the, on the NAEP question tool, the very first one, it takes you to a page that will look like this one. In the upper right corner, you have a tutorial that will teach you how to navigate the tool. But for, the, for this given example, what I plan to show you today, I will choose mathematics. So if you click on mathematics on the, where you see the second arrow, it will take you to a page like this one. Here, we have, you have, uh, as you all know, we assess students at grade 4, 8, and 12. So if you look on the, on the left corner, 
you will see the various grades and then you see the types of items that are given to the students that can be multiple choice, short concerted responses or extended concerted responses. And it is also a difficulty tab at the bottom. And then in the pane to the right, you have the list of questions of the year that the students were assessed and then the grade and the types of questions and some descriptor of the item. For the, for the purpose of this, um, of, of this webinar, I have decided to select to uncheck four and eight grade and only have the eight grade questions. If you look at uh, if you look at this tab, uh, if you look at this if you look at this tab right here, this one right here, you will see that we had altogether nine hundred and fifty items, mathematic items, at grade four, eight, and twelve that have been released over the years. And because I only have eight grade check, there are 114 questions that are uh, uh, 114 questions at grade eight. So how does one proceed from here? If, for example, you are a teacher and you are trying to assess a given skill, you can come here and set the questions of interest. So let's assume, for example, that I have selected a question here. This is, it will be the question that is highlighted. And after this question, that's highlighted. If you click on it, you see that a check mark, you see that a check mark appears right here. So that question is selected, and you see a one appearing right here in the workspace. It means that I have one question that I have selected. If a teacher in your district, for example, or anybody else wants to select several questions, you can check them, and the number of questions selected will show up, will increase as, you, as the, the number of check marks on the left increase. So let's proceed. So if, and from that page, if I click on the workspace, then I can see here, I can see here the question that I selected. That's the question. If I have selected more than one question, I will have several of them populated right here, maybe for the test or an exam, or just to see how my students will do on a NEP assessment. Here to the right, you have the option to choose to either see only the question that was given to the students, the scoring guide, how NEP scored the question. You can see some sample student responses, and you can see the performance data the performance summary data on how students perform either at a national level or at your state level or district level, and I will show you how to access that information. After you have selected what you are interested in, you can choose you can choose all of that to be output in a world in a world format or HTML. So for example, if you just want to give a test, you can just select the questions and have them output in a world format and give that to your students. And then for the teacher, for the teacher, the teacher can output the scoring guide to try to have some consistent scores as we did, as uh, we do the NEP assessment. So you have all of this available here. Let's, so if for, if for, for the case of my example, I'm going to try to output a question, the scoring guide, and the performance data at a national level. So if I did that, here, I have the statement of the question. So it, the question had two parts. It had a multiple choice, and then the student could, could then explain the answer. So here we have uh, the the solution is to check the check yes, and that is the that's that, that that's the answer here. So the for the scoring guide here tells about two about this is how we scored it. We have the, we have correct one and correct two. Correct one, assume that the student filled the right oval and then explain the answer. That's oval, that's the correct one. You also have correct two. I just assume that the student only didn't fill any didn't fill any oval but answer the question. Then you have the partial correct one, partial correct two, and then incorrect one and incorrect two. If you look here to the right, we have the performance at a national level. So in 2011, at a national level, 18% of students who took the assessment had incorrect two. 13% incorrect one, 3% has partial one, 1% partial. 
two uh, three percent partial to one uh, uh, three percent partial one. We had almost no incorrect to, and sixty one percent of the students uh, answer uh, uh, filled the correct over and answer the, the the question right, and one percent omitted the question. Now, if you were if if you were if you were interested now in seeing how the students in your district did in this question, the best way to access that is to click is to click here instead on the view question detail. If you click on view question detail, you have a page that looks like this, where you still have the full statement of the question available right here. You have some description of the type of, of the question on the left hand side. And now you have these other options here where you can see the scoring guide, you can see the sample student question, you can see the national data, and here is where you choose your jurisdiction. So here, if you are a teacher in the classroom, you can give it to your students, see how they did, see your jurisdiction. If you are in a, in a Tudor district, you can see how your student compared to the students in your Tudor that took the assessment, or you can compare on how the, the students in your state did. So how, do we, how, how does one go about that? If you are here and you click on jurisdiction, here you have the here you have the option. If you click on this drop down right here, you have the option to select the state or the tutor. Or in this case, in this in the case of this presentation, I selected Jefferson County, not for any particular reason. Here, just an example. And here you have the performance of students in Jefferson County, the way that you saw in the first slide. In, in the way you saw in the earlier slide, so you can compare this these percentages to the national percentage. And uh, I will conclude my presentation by, leave, by giving the link to the NC, to the NIP website so that you can embark on uh, the first step of the presentation and the link to the data tool. Th thank, you, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, we appreciate that, and thank you to all of our speakers today. Now we want to take the last few minutes of time that we have to um, respond to any attendee questions that have been provided to us during a brief question and answer session. If you haven't yet submitted a question, you can do so online. Our facilitator for this component is Amy Buckley. She's been reviewing and organizing the questions and will present them to the appropriate speaker today. Amy? Thank you so much, Cornelia, and thank you to our wonderful panelists. As Cornelia just mentioned, there's still time to submit your question. We'll do the best we can, uh, being mindful of your time, and we appreciate your uh, attendance today. Also, if you do submit a question, please remember to direct it to all panelists and provide your name and organization when you type in your question. Our first question today comes from Stephen DeWitt with the Association for Career and Technical Education. He asks, are there any implications related to career and technical education and other similar programs that are not part of the core curriculum as a result of the NAEP work? Cornelia, could you start us off with that? As I read that question, it brings to mind some of the preparedness work of the governing board as well as the link to the Common Core. I will uh, make an attempt to answer it. I don't have a fixed answer here, but I will tell you that um, it, particularly in reading, we have applied texts that are applied in areas that might include career and technical information, so I don't have any statistics on how much of that we have. But in addition to literature, there's also informational texts, some of which might be applicable to career and tech. I also know that in the area of mathematics, science, and an assessment that we're currently developing called technology and engineering literacy, we will have uh, many items in those disciplines that are related to career and technical education because they are applied questions, not in an isolated mathematics context, mathematics or science context. And uh, many of the skills as uh, people curriculum leaders tell us for mathematics, science are equivalent for math, science, 
and a career technical education. So I think you would find if you were to go through, as Emmanuel has shown you, and looked at some of the uh, items on the NAEP questions too, you would find some that are applicable. Now in terms of what Amy mentioned about our preparedness work, we have been trying to look at uh, what our 12th grade exam has. And one of the things that we have found is that there are not really workplace uh, texts yet. So we've been working on augmenting our 12th grade assessment to include those workplace texts in the assessment. So we do believe that uh, the reading and math skills that career and technical students need are the same as those that all students need. Thank That's you it, so Amy. much, Cornelia. <laughs> Thank you. Our second question comes from Linda Smith, an elementary science specialist at Paulsboro Public Schools in Paulsboro, New Jersey, and she's also the president of the New Jersey Science Teachers Association. She asks a broad question, uh, wondering where the focus is on science. Uh, many of you talked about literacy and mathematics, and I believe, Dee Dee, in your presentation, you referenced a goal for Chicago Public Schools related to literacy and mathematics. So perhaps you could start us off, and then others can follow. Where is the focus on science right now with Common Core? Uh, that is a fantastic question. Um, so what we've been working on this year is uh, starting to integrate our content area teachers, both science and social science, in uh, understanding the literacy and the technical subjects and, and social sciences standards. Um, we've been starting to build uh, alignment between uh, how we teach content area literacy and content standards and how we start to, uh, to build capacity of teachers to understand what that looks like, to understand what um, the teaching of specific reading and, and literacy skills looks like in a particular content area. Um, now, of course, that's with the existing content standards. Um, we are eagerly anticipating, as I'm sure all other districts are, um, what the, the next generation science standards look like. Um, so that we can start to build into our implementation plan uh, how those new content standards also get aligned to, um, to our existing plans for maintaining the, the focus on uh, literacy in those content areas. Um, so again, it's, it's you know, a gradual approach. And uh, once we start to see what the science standards are and start to understand how that fits into, especially in, in high school, um, how that fits with our existing uh, strong focus on the college readiness standards. Um, we'll start to build out, you know, a plan for moving towards those content standards. Thank you so much, Dee Dee. Winston or Terry, did you have anything to add from your areas? Uh, in Kentucky, uh, our our integration project uh, is using uh, the Common Core with science and social studies teachers uh, to develop 21st century types of uh, uh, formative assessment. Uh, so that, that's something I might direct them to. And second thing is uh, we're one of the lead states working with ACHIEVE on the next generation science standards. And our plan in Kentucky is to implement the science standards in a similar fashion that we've done with English language arts and math. So we'll probably be working on that uh, next school year. Great, thank you so much. And, and this is Robin Hall. I just wanted to add that the Council of the Great City Schools uh, is also collaborating and planning with ACHIEVE uh, on um, making sure that we are able to support districts in uh, implementing the next generation science standards. And this is Winston from Albuquerque. Um, I'm kind of like Terry. I, I think we're going to try to get math and ELL, ELA going first. And then um, I think our focus really is to look at science for the following year. Great. Thank you all so much. And we have one more question for today. And it's from Alan Young with Jefferson, Jefferson County Public Schools. And it's, it's a, a philosophical assessment approach question. Uh, and he asks, when will we move towards a 21st century capacities frame to build the core of the student via authentic learning and demonstrations of learning 
like in Finland, instead of narrow 20th century content framed core measured mostly by multiple choice tests. I know you're all grappling with assessments and didn't know if anybody had a response to Mr. Young in terms of the type of assessments going forward. Um, um, I'll this start. Is... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go right ahead. Uh, this is Cornelia, and I'll start with this because I recently went to a seminar on assessing 21st century schools. Uh, that was conducted by the National Academies of Science um, Board on Testing and Assessment. And one of the things I learned there was that the assessment art of assessing 21st century skills is not well defined. And there are many differences in the um, uh, academic community about how best to assess them. There is, seems to be some consolidation of opinion around how to assess the cognitive content-based skills component of the 21st century skills framework. Uh, and I would say that NAEP does that quite well when you take all of our assessments put together. What we are working on with the technology and engineering literacy assessment is a way to uh, assess more collaborative uh, work and use of tools beyond paper and pencil. So, some of the more open-ended questions really begin to get at these higher level cognitive skills that are in the 21st century framework. The others are really uh, classroom-based skills and would have to be measured there. When, when the state of the art and there is some consensus around how to measure best the 21st century skills, I think you'll see that NAEP is eager to move in that direction. Um, uh if, uh, if, I, if I may, uh, this is Emmanuel at NCS. We have uh, um, a, a report card coming out soon. I think Cornell forgot about forgot to mention that. It's uh, the interactive computer task where we are giving the assessment to students in a computer simulated environment where they have to actually perform experiments and uh, report on their results. I will probably assume that that's a very good step towards the 21st century. And uh, as it was mentioned earlier, we also have our technology, engineering, and literacy assessment that's coming out sometime soon. It will also have the types of elements in it. So we are somehow moving away from the traditional paper and pencil and, uh, and uh, concerted responses. Thank you. This is uh, Terry in Kentucky. Uh, since that was a Kentucky uh, question, um, what we're actually working on in Kentucky is uh, through uh, our integrated, uh, our literacy uh, uh, collaborative project where we're developing actual 21st century units uh, where teachers uh, in their classrooms actually develop longer extended types of uh, units and formative assessments that are not paper, pencil, uh, multiple choice driven. Uh, and this is very much connected to uh, the Partnership for 21st Century Skills and, uh, and the work we're doing as one of the states engaged in that to develop the next state of the art, what does 21st century assessment uh, look like and uh, around the four C's of 21st century skills. So uh, that's slow work, like Cornelia said, uh, there's no state of the art uh, on that yet and it's uh, in the process of being uh, developed. And I'll just uh, jump in also, um, here in Chicago we were moving along a similar path. Uh, we piloted um, some assessments this year that were aligned to Common Core in, in literacy and math uh, that were developed in-house um, that really got to this idea, especially in literacy, of uh, more complex tasks and, and close reading. Um, and the plan for next year is to, to continue that work to make assessments a, a core part of our, our framework um, and align it also to our um, our measures of teacher effectiveness so that there's alignment in expectations of students and expectations of teachers and that we are looking at um, assessment in a more rigorous, complex way and, and not uh, solely relying on one measure like a multiple choice assessment that we know doesn't fully assess all of the, the skills aligned to um, the Common Core standards. Um, 
you know, we're working to uh, continue to develop those assessments. We're also partnering with um, a few of the writers of the standards to uh, undergo review of the assessments that are getting developed. Um, and we're working with uh, Mars Tasks on the math side as well, the Mathematics Assessment Resource Service, uh, which really provide a, a helpful bank of, um, of high cognitive demand tasks in, in all of the math domains. Um, so, it, you know, it's a gradual work in, in progress, and we're definitely excited to see some of the piloting of uh, park assessment items as they come out. Great. Thank you so much. That concludes the Q&A, Cornelia. Well, thank you, Amy, and thanks to all of you who submitted questions today. Um, I also would like to thank Emmanuel for mentioning, mentioning the interactive computer tasks and the hands-on tasks, which are a part of the science assessment. And um, also, before we end, I would like to let you know that this May we will be releasing uh, the most recent assessment results, which are the um, science assessment from 2011, and we will have the release of the uh, hands-on and interactive computer task later in the summer. To stay informed of all of these activities, you may visit the Governing Board's website at www.nagb.org, and you can follow the Governing Board on Facebook and Twitter if you know how to do that. And I would just like to, in closing, thank all of today's speakers for sharing their insights regarding this important transition for our nation's education system. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this event. I hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs>